now. Well, my next guest is Dr. Kerry Spackman, who's a neuroscientist and winner of the 2009 Kia World Class Award for Creative Thinking. He's also been a long-term consultant to four Formula One teams on simulator design. Uh, mathematics and driver optimization, and a mental health trainer for many world champions, including the All Blacks, Formula One drivers, and Olympic gold medalists. He's also just written a book called The Ant and the Ferrari, Lifting the Hood on Truth, Society, and the Universe, essentially uh, attempting to answer the big questions. And uh, he joins us via live Skype video today. Uh, good morning to you, Kerry. Good morning, Glenn. Yeah, so you don't um, go you know, half go about this by halves, really, do you? Um, straight in there with the big questions in this in this book. Yes, well, it's always been a passion of mine. I've always wanted to know what is truth, and the reason for that, of course, is that there's so many different beliefs in in society and in life, and I didn't want to go through life playing by the wrong rules. So I've been passionate about this all my life. And um, because of that, I decided I should write a book about it because no one seemed to have a, a book that covered all the issues that I faced. Well, it's, it's um, one of those weeks, though, really, where you do start to think about the big questions, particularly with the transit uh, of Venus on, on Wednesday. Um, I, I saw it here at work. I put on the solar glasses, had a look, and it really does make you sort of step outside of yourself and think about you know, the universe and that we are on this tiny little planet and we, there are other things out there. You know, you do start to to see yourself as quite insignificant compared to everything else. Well, the scale of the universe, of course, is uh, quite extraordinary. Uh, I mean, I don't know if you know this, probably your your listeners do, but if you take a handful of sand uh, off a beach and you count the number of grains of sand in your hand, mm. that's about as many stars as you can see on a, on a clear night. But if you go to every single beach in the entire world, dig right down until you hit rocks, walk from the land all the way down to the sea, uh, and then you count all the grains of sand in every beach of every island all around America and the Greek islands and whatever, the number of grains of sand uh, in all the beaches in the world is, a number, or is actually a tenth of the number of stars in the entire universe. And of course, each of those stars is separated by billions and billions of kilometers. So the universe is, is vast, but what's really exciting about it is that even though we are tiny little insignificant creatures, yeah. we've been able to work out how it all came uh, came about, and it's a really pretty exciting uh, journey. Yeah, but so, and so and we know a lot of this, and science is, you know, is, is accelerating our knowledge of all this kind of stuff, but um, generally, we know nothing, though, don't we? We, uh, you know, you, you say you say in the book, um, and, and the, it sort of hints in the title as well, the ant and the Ferrari, that we are like ants crawling across the bonnet of the Ferrari, Ferrari, where we have no idea of really how things work underneath the surface. Well, I think there's two aspects to that question. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, Unaided, humans have very limited ability to see the universe and what's going on. And the second point is, of course, when you do actually finally lift the, the hood on the universe, uh, it's a very exciting thing to find out under there. You, you get so much more richness and texture in life. And so the question is, what is a reliable way of lifting that hood? How can you um, do this in a way that you're going to find truth? Mm. And it turns out there are certain tools that uh, help you find truth uh, and for me, truth is a belief that matches reality. Uh, so in the old days, we had we could believe any old thing, you know. So uh, if there was lightning, we would say, oh, well, that's Zeus throwing thunderbolts from heaven. And there was no way to really test that. Yeah. But over the years, we've developed very good tools that can rule in and rule out beliefs that match reality. And so what I'm passionate about is uh, developing those tools, uh, using them in a way that is exciting for the reader. To, to bridge the gap so they don't have to be experts in these things, but they can see the magic underneath. What, one of those tools um, you call the compass of truth. What, what is that? Okay, so um, I think whenever I, because, because I've been passionate about this for so long, I've ended up talking to literally thousands of people. And, you know, first of all, the first thing I always get is, well, there's no such thing as absolute truth. Uh, you know, your belief is just as valid as mine. So that's the first starting point, and you'd be surprised how often I get that uh, statement. But of course, that's not true. There are things that are absolutely true. So, for example, all of mathematics is absolutely true. Um, it would be true even if there was no universe. So, for example, you know, the theorem of Pythagoras uh, describing triangles, mm. c squared equals a squared plus b squared, that's true. It's always true for a plane, 
And um, we didn't invent that, we just discovered that. So we have this region of things called absolute truth. The question then is, what? how does that relate to the rest of the universe? Because ab mathematics is abstract, like logic. Um, and so we go from things that are absolutely true to things that are very, very close to being absolutely true, which I call for all practical purposes true. So things that are highly connected with mathematics, that are highly connected with observations that are independent of our own perspective, these things we can say would be for all practical purposes true. And then we move around the compass to things we are less and less certain about. And so these are the things that are in the true section of our belief system. There are also things that are neither true nor false, um, and those would be things like love, beauty. Mm. Um, they're very important to humans, but they, they are neither true nor false. So even the statement, um, Mozart was better than Led Zeppelin, that's not a statement that is either true or false. Yeah. It could be true for me, yeah. and it could be false for you, but it's not something that is absolutely true. It's only personally true. So those would be neither true nor false statements. And then, of course, there's part of the compass I call the great unknown, all the things we don't know. And you know, one of the things we have found out as life has gone by is how much we just don't know. You know, you take a person in the 16th, 17th century, they had no idea about electromagnetism and all these other things and radio waves that we now know about. And so it's likely that we're still only scratching the surface. So my compass of truth is a way of showing you where beliefs fit in terms of certainty and also importance for, for people, because some beliefs aren't important, some beliefs are very important. Mm. Um, because I think for me, what what is vital is that beliefs have consequences. If you have a false belief, in other words, a belief that doesn't match reality, almost inevitably there's some cost to society. <laughs> And I, and that gets us round to um, the the other part of the book where you um, put the case for a more ethical society and even put the question forward. Well, uh, is this idea of capitalism had its day? Um, so ha so in the process of looking for answers, are, are we able to get some clues as to where we should be headed as a society? Yes, I think so. I think for me, it's not just an abstract process where we just want to work out abstract values of truth and false. Um, what we're really passionate about is making the world a better place. And so we observe certain um, structures that are existing in society, often because of um, historical reasons. And so um, one of the things I take on is capitalism. Now, Capitalism has been fantastically successful um, in terms of giving us a better life. Um, you know, we drive lovely cars and we live in comfortable homes with microwaves and so on. And to a large extent, that's a result of both science and capitalism. But the trouble is uh, capitalism sort of drives you up a curve of more and more um, complexity and more and more uh, efficiency, it's very efficient, mm. but you can keep going to a point where you, you suddenly start becoming not robust. And to give you a quick example, um, if you go back you know, 200 years ago, probably all the bread was produced in your local bakery. Mm. And there were hundreds, if not thousands, of these bakeries scattered around your country. But as time goes by, we realize, as, we realize that's not efficient. So we gradually consolidate, and we end up with these great big factories that produce all the bread uh, for a city, and everything's sh shipped around the, 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 the city. Um, but the trouble is, this then becomes m more and more efficient, but less and less robust. And uh, so, you know, for example, if there's a problem with the electricity at that bread factory, all the bread stops, or the drivers... Um, have a trouble delivering or whatever, then all the bread stops. Whereas the old system, while it's not efficient, was very robust. Mm. And so what I'm really interested in is finding the correct balance between robustness and efficiency in the capitalist society. And, you know, I was shocked many years ago, or oh, it was about seven years ago, I suppose, I was in England and um, there was a petrol tanker driver's strike. I think there was about 90 of these drivers who delivered the fuel from the big uh, reservoirs into the petrol stations. Yeah. And I thought, okay, no big deal. Three days later, England was completely brought to its knees. Mm. Supermarkets had shut down. Uh, hospitals had closed. Three days the whole of England had completely shut down because 90 tanker drivers went on strike. And you go, now, that's not robust. It might be efficient, but it's not robust. 
So that's the sort of thing we can talk about. And there are things you can tweak with the system to make it better. Does, does capitalism ignore the facts or the truth, perhaps, that, uh, that resources are limited? Well, the problem with cap- capitalism per se is it's all about the biggest bang for your buck. How can you get the best product to the customer at the best price? And that's what it's driven by, effectively. Uh, and as you say, you know, historically, we effectively did have unlimited resources. If we wanted more oil, we just dug another hole and pour it out of the ground mm. or, or various other resources. Now we are really starting to struggle with resources. And also the consequence of all this production is pollution and things that we need to recycle. So capitalism unfettered on its own won't take account of that. So what then happens is you have a lot of rules and regulations put in place to try and stop uh, capitalism being dangerous. Mm. So there's never, there isn't a really free market. I mean, you know, a, a classic example would be tobacco. Um, free markets, we just pour out more and more cigarettes um, and the world consumes them. But we've decided that's not good for society. And so we put these huge regulations in about who can buy them, how it's packaged and massive taxes. And that's, that's a sort of very punitive way of approaching it. But there are many other things that you need to bring into society, the rules of society, the rules of capitalism, that make it more robust and better for society. Because it's not just about how much you can produce, but how good it is for society. Mm. Now, in the process of putting the book together, you, you um, interviewed and spoke to um, all kinds of people from um, all areas of society and around the world. It, in your opinion, in your view, is the world at some kind of turning point? Are we at a cornerstone right now? Is, is the last few years and the next few years, is this, is this an important time? This is a really critical time. And um, we've got so many things all coming together, whether it's geopolitics, whether it's uh, oil resources. Um, there's just so many things happening. Um, and the way the whole financial uh, institutions are structured, you can see this kind of um, machinations now. These are symptoms of things not being right. I, I know in the past people have uh, prophesied gloom and doom, but I think we are in a very different space now than we used to be. And, you know, history shows that there are great civilizations and great times that just seemed like they were going to go on forever. The Ottoman Empire, the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, that just goes on and on the list. And then these things collapse. And I don't want to be alarmist, but I think there are things that we can do to make uh, the transition from our uh, historical capitalist-driven society to a better version in the future? It's not a simple answer. I mean, if there are any simple answers, all the politicians would have jumped straight on them. So it's not simple, but there are reasonably complex ways we can do that. And I I try to point out some in the book. The other thing I think that's really important is that it's not just top down, it's not just regulations and structural parts of society. It also starts from the individual. You know, if you are passionate about society, if you are passionate about people around you, and we all are, then we'll do better. If we're all selfish and narcissistic, then uh, society, no matter what regulations you put in place, are going to be in trouble. Mm. Fascinating stuff. And the book is called The Ant and the Ferrari, Lifting the Hood on Truth, Society and the Universe, out now on HarperCollins. It's also the website, antandferrari.com. Uh, Kerry Spackman, Dr. Kerry Spackman, has been my guest on live Skype video, and we really appreciate you um, joining us this morning. It's been fantastic, and I've enjoyed it. Thank Have you a very great much. day. Cheers. Thanks.